Welcome. Uh, my name is Cheryl Lovato Niles. I am the WSU Whatcom County Extension Water Resources Educator. And this talk is being hosted tonight by the Whatcom Watershed Information Network, otherwise known as WIN, and the Whatcom County Marine Resources Committee Speaker Series. And this is part of our ongoing speaker series. Uh, WIN is a non-advocacy, apolitical network of diverse interests supporting community engagement on water resource topics. The Whatcom MRC is part of the federal Northwest Straits Marine Conservation Initiative and works to protect and enhance the marine environment. This event is also part of Water Week, which is a week-long celebration of our water resources. To learn more about Water Week and all of our Water Week events, you can go to www.whatcomwaterweeks.org slash events. We are really excited to host this presentation tonight. Before we get started, I'll go over some of the virtual etiquette and how to's. This meeting is being recorded and hopefully will also be live streamed on Facebook. The recording will be made available on the Whatcom Watersheds Information Network website, which is whatcomwin.org, and will also be available on the WIN Facebook page. Feel free to review it and or share it with friends or colleagues who may have missed it. To minimize bandwidth requirements, participants' microphones are muted and cameras are off. There are, we are gonna have a question and answer session after Jenny gives her presentation. And there are two ways that you can ask questions. You can use the chat function or you can use, or you can ask your question in person, in, in person verbally by using the raise hand function. Um, to use the chat function, if you hover your mouse at the bottom of the screen, you can bring up your controls and there you should see the chat button. If you click that, you'll pull up the chat window and there you can type in your questions. Please go ahead and type your questions to everyone. You have a choice to type, uh, you can choose to everyone or you can choose to type your question to just an individual. Please type your questions to everyone. And feel free to go ahead and enter your questions as we are, um, as we are going along. That way we'll be ready to go when we get to the question and answer session. And um, to raise your hand, you open up the participants window by clicking on participants in the Zoom controls, again, at the bottom of your screen. And then look to the, to the bottom of that participants box. You should find a blue hand there and you'll click on that. If you are joining us by phone, you can raise your hand by hitting the star nine and that will raise your hand. We are almost ready to start, but before we do, I was interested in launching a couple of um, quick polls that I thought might be an interesting way for us to get a sense of um, who our audience is and uh, so this first one, I'll just give you a couple of minutes to answer it. This is just asking folks where they're zooming in from. And uh, while I'm giving you all a moment to answer the poll, I do want to just also say that our hearts go out to everyone who has been harmed by these devastating wildfires all along the West and further inland that we've been experiencing for the last few weeks. Um, I myself have family in the LA area and in the Bay Area in California. And I also want to express some gratitude for the firefighters who are working so hard to try to contain these fires. Uh, we will all be grateful to get some rain. I am now delighted to introduce our speaker. Jenny Ko is the Community Wildfire Resilience Coordinator for the Whatcom and Skagit Conservation Districts. Jenny has served, has been serving conservation districts in Washington State since 2001 and has been working with communities and partners on wildfire preparedness in the Pacific Northwest region for 15 years. She currently coordinates the Community Wildfire Resilience Program for both Whatcom and Skagit Conservation Districts. Jenny splits her time between working one-on-one -on -one with landowners and neighborhood groups on wildfire preparedness 
I'm working at the planning scale with local, state, and federal partners to assess risk and create collaboration opportunities in her region. She has a degree from, from Huxley College of the Environment at WWU and has been a full-time Whatcom County resident for 18 years. Jenny, go ahead and uh, take it away. All right, thank you, Cheryl. Uh, I appreciate this opportunity to um, celebrate Water Week with everybody and thank you everyone that's on here for sharing your evening with me. Um, I'm going to close this poll, Cheryl, I see it up on my screen. Is that okay? Yes, go ahead. Okay, close that. So um, before I get into my specific presentation, I just wanted to give a quick overview of the Whatcom Conservation District, which is where I'm working from. Um, for those of you who may not know what a conservation district is. So we've been around since 1946, believe it or not. Um, and we work with landowners and farmers to foster a healthy and sustainable relationship between people and their environment. And the way that we do that is by providing technical and financial assistance to landowners. And um, we're non-regulatory. We do have a board of supervisors that oversees um, our priorities and what we do. And they are both appointed and elected positions on our board. Um, we also are uh, grant funded. We work mostly from, um, let's see, we have county grants, city grants, and we have some state and federal funding that allows us to work with landowners as well. So we've been around for quite a while and I'm very happy to be part of this group. I think we do some pretty awesome stuff up at the Whatcom Conservation District. Um, I have included the, our um, website address on this slide for you in case you wanna go excuse me, learn more about us. Oh, my slide is not advancing, hold on. Come on. Uh-oh, <laughs> let me try something else here. It, there we go, we just had a delay, I suppose. Okay, um, we can get through these technical difficulties today. <laughs> so my, my um, presentation is titled Watershed Friendly and Wildfire Safe Properties. And I wanna explain briefly why I titled it this. Um, I know this is water week, so we're focused on a lot of water resource type issues and celebrations. Um, and so through my particular program, I'm very focused on um, working with landowners and communities on reducing their wildfire risk around their properties. But working for a conservation district, um, there's a lot of other natural resource priorities that were, are important and that we're trying to balance as well. So, when I'm out talking to people and I'm making recommendations about how to make their property safer for wildfire, I'm also taking into consideration other priorities for a healthy watershed. So, you know, water quality issues, um, attracting wildlife to their property, um, a healthy forest, things like that. So you can have a fire safe property and um, support a healthy watershed at the same time. So that's kind of what I'm gonna be talking about along with some more specifics on actually how to reduce wildfire risk around your property. So I wanna start out with a little bit of science foundation here. Um, there's a number of, well, there's scientists all over the country and the world that are working on um, climate change impacts, but particularly at University of Washington, there's a group that's studying um, wildfire risk in Western Washington and how climate change is impacting that. And so what they found is that um, our air temperatures are increasing, we have less rain in the summer, and our snow is melting earlier. And that is leading to drier forests and drier fuels and vegetation on the ground. And so with drier forests and more arid fuels, um, that is a situation that's much more conducive to wildfire. And so the bottom line is that the wildfire risk is increasing in Western Washington. So let's talk about some potential ignition sources for fire. So there's surface fire, which is, um, you know, fire burning along the surface of the ground. It's, you know, burning through grass and shrubs and leaf litter and stuff like that. And if there's no break in that vegetation, that fire is going to keep carrying, especially if there's wind behind it and potentially carry to structures. 
Then we have crown fires, which are something we don't really see in Western Washington. They're pretty extreme and that's when you have fire and flames burning across the top in the canopy of the trees and across the canopy of the trees. And the radiant heat from some of those flames in a crown fire can ignite a solid wood wall up to 120 feet away. So it's pretty serious. Um, luckily, we don't get a lot of that around here yet. Um, and then there's blowing embers. And actually, um, well, so when I talk about blowing embers, embers are small pieces of burning material that are getting picked up by the wind and blown other places. So you can have embers blowing a mile ahead or more of the main fire. They cause spot fires in other places. Um, and they also tend to be really small. So they land, they can collect in cracks and crevices around your home and your structures um, and cause a lot of problems. And actually embers are the number one reason why homes are burned down. So a lot of the focus on wildfire risk reduction activities um, that I'm gonna remark that I'm gonna recommend is kind of focused on embers and how they can affect your structure. So there's been a lot of research about how homes ignite. Um, you may have seen, I'm sure you've seen, um, the news where they show, you know, a community in California or, or in or Washington where a massive wildfire has burned through and you're seeing, you know, 30 homes that have burned down and then three that are left untouched. And the scientists were like, okay, why are these homes still here? Why did they survive <clears throat> and not the other ones? So after 30, 40 years of research, um, what was found was that homes are igniting due to the condition of the home itself and everything um, around it out to 200 feet from the foundation. So they term this the home ignition zone. So everything I'm gonna be talking about tonight is, is are things that you can do within that home ignition zone. So the home ignition zone is actually broke up into like three different smaller zones. And in each of those zones, you can do different types of activities that will have the most effect on um, wildfire safety. So there's that immediate zone, which is the structure itself, and then the area around it up to five feet. Then there's the intermediate zone, which is the five feet to 30 feet out from the structure and the extended zone, which is 30 to 100 or 200 feet out. And so when I say 100 to 200, it's because if you have a, a flat piece of property, 100 feet out is where you want to focus your out to 100 feet out is where you want to focus your actions. Um, if you are on a property that's sloped and steep, you may you might need to have um, address your fuels and do your wildfire risk reduction farther out from your house because of that slope and how slopes can carry fire uphill. So the area where um, you are doing construction and vegetation modifications around your structures are for wildfire risk reduction purposes is called creating a defensible space. And when we say defensible space, it really implies that there will be somebody there to defend your home. So it's, it's really important to do this work ahead of time because you are creating hopefully a, a space that's safe for firefighters to be there to defend your home. But in a lot of cases, uh, a large wildfire will threaten you know, hundreds of homes at the same time and there aren't enough resources to put firefighters at every home. So really in the ideal scenario, you've created what we call a survivable space where you've made these modifications, you've done the work ahead of time, and if you've been evacuated and there's nobody there to defend your home, then the idea is that hopefully it will survive on its own. Now we know nothing is fireproof really, but um, you, these are the things that have been proven to make a huge difference in whether homes survive or not. Okay, so I'm gonna start kind of talking about the structure itself and then I'm gonna work out talking more about our landscape features when it comes to wildfire risk reduction. So I'm gonna start with the roof because the roof is the most vulnerable part of your structure just because of its surface area and its exposure. So as far as roofing goes, um, class A rated roofs have the highest resistance to fire. And so those are roofs like metal roofs, um, composition shingle roofs, concrete or clay tile, which I don't see a lot of around here, um, but they are—they do exist. Those are um, class A rated roofs. 
a roof that looks like the one in the picture on the bottom of this slide, which is a wood shake roof that is untreated, um, is extremely flammable. So if you can imagine blowing embers landing on that roof, it's very dried out. It has lots of cracks and crevices for um, embers to land in, and it's also covered in moss, which is very flammable. So as far as roof ratings, it gets a little complicated because it can change depending on how the materials have been treated when it's being made and also how the product is actually put on. So you can actually have a wood shake roof that is class A rated um, if it's been chemical and pressure treated appropriately and if the underlayment under the roof is fire resistant as well when it's installed. So there are some additional details to what it means to have a class A rated roof, um, but in general, a metal and a composition roof are going to be great for fire resistance. I did include a link at the bottom and obviously you're probably not going to be writing that all down right now. Um, but since this uh, presentation will be available in PDF form, you should be able to click on that link and go directly to some more information about fire resistant roofing. So the other thing that's really important um, is the condition and the maintenance of the roof and the gutters. Metal gutters are ideal, vinyl gutters will actually melt. Um, and what you wanna make sure of is that you don't have a lot of um, tree debris and things accumulating on your roof or in your gutters, like in this picture to the left. Um, that just creates a real flammable fuel bed for embers to land in and smolder and then ignite something. So you want to make sure those things are cleaned off during fire season um, because they cause a lot of problems. Okay, as far as your siding and windows goes, um, this picture you're seeing here of the house is actually a still shot from a video that was created um, by the insurance, is, I always get this wrong, Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety. And they do a lot of research on how um, natural disasters affect homes and structures and how things burn and they get to play with fire and, and it looks really fun. Um, but so they do, they, what they did was they created, they built this house and half of it is built out of um, fire resistant materials and the other half is built out of flammable materials. And then they just blew embers full force at this structure to see what would ignite and where, where it would ignite. So this is a still shot from that video, which I provided a link below if you want to check that out later. Um, and so the, the structure on the right side that is not burning has a fiber cement siding on it. Um, a, a real common one that you hear about um, or you see on houses is called hardy board. Um, brick and stucco are also very fire resistant. Obviously, wood and vinyl are going to be much more flammable. Um, vinyl will melt, like I mentioned earlier um, in talking about the gutters. The other important thing about siding is that um, it, a lot of it can depend on what is next to your siding. So whatever you have in that immediate area, touching your house or around your house within that first five feet, can make a big difference as to whether your siding will ignite or not. And then as far as windows are concerned, um, double pane tempered glass windows are gonna withstand a lot more heat than a single pane window. I don't see a lot of single pane windows in houses anymore, um, but there are, they are there. And then the casing of the window is important. Aluminum or metal is, is gonna withstand, you know, more heat and uh, of flames than, you know, vinyl or plastic. Um, and then the skylights are important too because they're up on the roof, so they're more exposed. And so a glass skylight will be better than a plastic skylight. And the casing around it is also important too. You wanna to make sure that's in good shape and it's not you know, ripped up anywhere for where embers could get under and get to the roof. So um, venting, this is actually a really common place where embers have intruded and burnt homes down. And so um, it's really important to make sure that your vents have um, metal screening on them of a 1 8 inch size mesh. So usually when I'm out visiting people's homes and giving them an assessment, a wildfire risk assessment of their home, I usually see 1 quarter inch size metal mesh on their vent coverings. But you want 1 8 inch to keep embers out. That is the recommended size. Um, the other thing is with, with venting um, that's down towards the ground, like your crawl space or foundation vents, um, 
usually they're in set and so they just tend to collect a lot of whatever leaf debris is collecting on the ground there or bark. So you want to make sure that's all raked out. As far as um, decks, porches, and fencing, those are things that all tend to be connected to the house. And so if something is connected to the house, it can carry fire to the house. So it's important to pay attention to those things, even though they're kind of an extension of the home. Um, they can carry fire to the house too. So as far as um, porches and decks, there are ways to construct a deck or a porch that make it less um, likely to carry fire to the house. And it has to do with how big the spacing is between the boards and what you have in between the deck boards and your siding. Um, Cause you can put metal flashing in between there. There's also some special tape you can put on the end of your joists to keep fire from spreading if something catches on fire. Um, so there are ways to make it more fire resistant, but if you're not building a deck from scratch and you already have a deck, the things you wanna pay attention to are making sure that any of that tr same stuff that collects in your gutters will collect on your deck. So all that tree debris, pine cones, dry flammable stuff that collects in the corners, you wanna get that all cleaned out during fire season. Also the stuff that collects in between the boards if they're close together is another place you wanna look out for debris collecting in because those are the same places that embers will collect. The other really important thing about decks, especially if they're raised up, is if is what you're storing under there or what you have underneath your deck. You want to make that a non-flammable zone because if you're storing firewood under your deck, like the picture on the left, that's you're basically that's asking for trouble. Firewood is meant to burn. So you don't want to store firewood under there or anything else that's flammable. So ideally, under that space you have gravel, like in the middle picture there, um, or if you look really closely at the picture on the left, if you were to take that firewood and other stuff that they've stored under their deck out, I think it's a concrete pad under there. So that would be a, considered a fire resistant space right there, not having anything flammable underneath. So again, there are fact sheets about fire resistant decking materials that you can um, access in the link below. So moving out from the home itself, and um, we're starting to get out into the landscape area a little bit, that first five feet adjacent to your home is really important. And it's a very vulnerable area to whether your structure is gonna survive a fire or not. And so this is an area where you really ideally wanna have a non-flammable zone out to five feet, um, whether it's gravel perimeter around your house or, um, like a concrete sidewalk or stepping stones or something, just having a non-flammable area right there can make a big difference as to whether you know your siding will ignite. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that in a couple other slides. Um, the other thing is if you see the picture on the right, there's a massive accumulation of leaves and things that have collected and it's probably you know three to four inches deep. And that is actually very flammable too. So if you have stuff like that, you wanna rake it back away from your house at least five feet. Okay, um, so we're kind of moving into fire resistant landscaping now. And what I want to point out is that you do not have to have a landscape that looks like the surface of the moon to have it be fire resistant. While the surface of the moon, which actually this is what this picture is in the left of my screen here, um, is not really going to burn. Most people don't want to have a landscape that looks like that. And it's also not very good for um, a healthy watershed. So you don't have to have a landscape that looks like that. You can have a diverse and lush landscape and still have it be fire resistant. So if you are a homeowner and you are um, thinking about how you wanna manage your property and your landscaping, and you have a lot of priorities to balance, you're concerned about wildfire, um, but you also want to maybe live in the Lake Whatcom watershed, for example, and the health of the lake and the water quality is very important. And what you do on your property can make a difference as far as, you know, the health of the lake. And you want to attract wildlife and you have all these goals that you want to meet and you need to figure out how you can balance all that and have a fire resistant landscape. Um, I kind of just listed out some goals on this slide. So maybe you want to have a fire resistant landscape and you're worried about the impact from drought, which is a real thing because we're seeing a lot of um, 
of our western red cedars and our hemlocks and some of our dug firs being stressed out or dying due to um, accumulated years of drought. So um, considering drought resistant species could be really important. Um, you want to attract wildlife and you don't want to harm the water sources that are nearby. And yet you also want it to look nice and be inviting. So those are all things we can accomplish um, and have a fire resistant landscape. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. So um, one of the best things you can do is to use native plants in your landscaping. Native plants naturally are better adapted to thrive in our conditions. So they're, they're typically going to be in better condition. Um, and there are lots of native plants that are also fire and drought resistant. And native plants are more watershed friendly because they're better for wildlife. They provide habitat and food and other various things. So that's one way that you can incorporate something into your landscape that is going to be both fire resistant and help with other things. So another thing that native plants do really well is they will filter pollutants and help improve water quality. So this is a picture of a rain garden that was put in um, on a property in the Lake Whatcom watershed. And some of you may know that Lake Whatcom has an excess, a water quality issue that's due to excess phosphorus that causes algae, algae blooms in the lake. And so um, one of the ways that they're addressing that is to put more plants and mulch in versus you know, grass and hardscaping things. Because plants help uptake that um, phosphorus and, and pull it out of the runoff before it gets to the lake. But so native plants are great for that and you can do those things and have fire resistant native plants in your yard. So I wanted to give a few examples of some of those fire resistant native plants that are also great for habitat. Um, I'm not going to read all of these, but there's, you know, it varies from ground covers to shrubs to trees um, where we can meet all of those objectives. So for example, um, a nook rose is a native rose, um, it's fire resistant, and I think it's a great, uh, provides great nesting habitat for songbirds. Um, the Pacific crab apple attracts mason bees and hummingbirds, and it's also considered fire resistant. So there are a lot of choices of native fire resistant plants that are also great and provide habitat value. And I do wanna mention really quickly, I'm gonna show this on my screen and hopefully you guys can see it. Um, this is a really great resource it's called Fire Resistant Plants for Home Landscapes. And you can access um, this booklet in PDF format on our website. And I will give you that, um, those specific pages at the end of my presentation, but um, you can get information on that. And then also Whatcom CD does an annual plant sale. And when we put together our plant list, we also provide information on um, which plants are fire resistant, which plants are drought resistant, um, which ones attract pollinators, which ones are deer resistant. So all of that information can be found on the Whatcom CD website as well. So you don't have to go hunting for this too, too far. Oh, this is just another slide with some more examples that are colorful and lovely, like the Pacific rhododendron and the red flowering currant and the vine maple. So there's really lots of great options for your yard that are going to be great for wildlife habitat and for fire resistance. So what makes a plant fire resistant? So fire resistant plants are typically in, in good health. They're not, you know, suffering from drought or, or water stress or anything. Um, they tend to have higher moisture content in their leaves. Um, they have very little buildup of dead vegetation in them. Um, they're more resistant to drought and they typically have a lower compact growth form. So then there's a chart here I provided that just kind of shows um, a range of more fire resistant plants to less fire resistant plants. And you can see at the top are succulents and ground covers and at the bottom are grasses and conifers. So what makes a plant more flammable? It's all very relative. No plants are, are fireproof. Any plant can burn, but some just tend to be more flammable than others. And so um, flammable plants typically are more water stressed and they accumulate a lot of dead dry material inside and underneath them. They also usually have a high oil or resin content, looser papery bark, and they also tend to have stiff leathery leaves. 
So I threw a couple pictures of examples of very common um, Western Washington uh, flammable plants that we have around here or are planted in people's yards. Juniper is one. Um, it has a lot of dead, dense material in the center of it and underneath. The arborvitae are a very common, great tree for you know screening between you and your neighbors, but they also get a lot of dead stuff in the center and you know they're kind of go up like Roman candles and spread fire really quickly. Um, Scotch broom is another one. It's very invasive and it's also very flammable. And then um, blackberry canes are very dry and will ignite very readily. Um, and after talking to my firefighter colleagues, most, I don't know, maybe not most, but a lot of the fire spread that they see um, in Western Washington is a scenario where you have tall dry grass next to dead blackberry canes underneath um, larger conifer trees with lower hanging branches and it kind of just creates this ladder for fire to climb, so. Mulch, let's talk about mulch in your yard. Mulch is awesome. Um, it maintains soil moisture, it moderates the soil temperature, it helps keep down weeds, it can prevent erosion and compaction, and it can look really nice in your yard. So mulch is a great thing to have. However, what you wanna avoid is putting or any organic mulch within five feet of your structure. And this picture over here just kind of shows there was mulch right up next to their um, their porch and their plants, and I think some embers landed in it, and it was it can smolder unnoticed for a long time, create a lot of heat, and then flame up and cause destruction or damage to your home. So you want to have that mulch five feet out from your house. Um, and there are some mulches that tend to be a little more flammable than others, and I have those listed on the slide. Shredded rubber is one which I really don't see much of around here. Um, but I do see a lot of shredded western red cedar. Um, in shredded uh, material mulches tend to be a little bit more flammable than like the more bark chunky style mulches just because it takes more heat to ignite a larger more solid chunk of, of organic material. And then pine needles or sawdust type mulches are also pretty flammable. So those are the ones you want to avoid when you are mulching and planting. And some other mulch tips to think about. Um, if you are in the Lake Waco watershed, um, using a low phosphorus mulch product is really great because there's less or no leaching of extra phosphorus into the runoff. Um, you can also water your mulch at the same time you're watering your plants. So keeping your mulch, your mulch kind of moist during fire season can help it keep from, you know, if embers are landing in it, can help it keep it from smoldering. Um, and then you don't want to have super thick, deep mulch. You, want to keep it to about four inches maximum depth. And then um, like in this picture, you can kind of see that the, the homeowner has put this non-flammable strip right up against the house, which is cobble. And then outside of that, there's a barrier and then they have their mulch and then they have another barrier. So it looks nice, um, but you definitely want to have that mulch away from your house. So as far as, you know, designing a landscape or choosing where it's best to put things in a fire resistant landscape, you want to think about creating breaks between your vegetation. You want to avoid a continuous path of vegetation that fire can carry through to your structures. So the idea is to incorporate breaks along the surface. Um, so those can be things like driveways. Um, you know, driveways are a great break for in between your fuel. They're usually concrete or gravel or something like that. The fire is moving across the surface, it's going to hit something like that and it's going to lay down. Rock features are also great to break up that vegetation. This may or may not work for your landscape, but these are just some ideas. The other thing is short grass can, can act as a fuel break as well. Um, fire's not going to carry very well through sh very short grass. Um, Green grass also helps, but that's not always the best, um, wisest choice for water conservation. So it's more important that the grass is kept short. And then water features are great. Um, you know, ponds and things like that are great features to have in breaking up your vegetation in your landscape. And of course, they're great for um, water sources for wildlife and birds. So the idea is that you're kind of clustering your planting areas and just breaking up that surface so you don't have a bunch of 
flammable material as a continuous path. So in these pictures, this homeowner has some short grass lawn and they've got, you know, larger trees and ferns kind of in more pocketed areas. So that kind of helps break up that landscape. And then as far as the height for the grass, the recommended maximum height for not spreading fire quickly is four inches. The other thing you want to think about in your landscape that's really important is creating space vertically. So continuous vegetation from the ground up into larger trees creates a path for fire to climb and that's what we call a ladder fuel because a fire burning on the ground is relatively easy to deal with but once it gets into a larger tree it's much more difficult to put out and then it ends up you know throwing embers on things on roofs and decks and things like that. So you want to create some vertical breaks in your vegetation. And you can have varying canopy layers throughout your landscape, which is great for birds and wildlife habitat. You can still do that, but what you want to avoid is that continuous ladder fuel. So in order to reduce those ladder fuels within your home ignition zone, the best thing most of the time to do is just to prune up the lower limbs of those larger trees. So we're looking at a six to 15 foot spread of distance um, up the tree. And there are definitely some tips as far as proper pruning so you don't hurt or damage your trees because you don't want to prune more than a third of the canopy of a tree. So if you have that option, pruning is great to create that separation. The other thing you can do um, is if you have blackberries or tall grass or something, you keep your grass mode and haul those blackberries out. Um, we do have a, a great brochure on proper pruning for conifers that's also available on our website. So, um, and I will show you that link at the end. Some other considerations to keep in mind, um, and this is, remember, this is within your home ignition zone. So we're talking 100 to two feet, 200 feet from your home, not, you know, farther beyond that. Um, so you don't want to have heavy accumulations of dead plant materials. Um, or blow down from storms. That stuff is basically creating a, a campfire, if you will, or if flame gets in there, it's gonna go up and spread quickly. So while you know branch piles are great for wildlife, moving them out beyond that home ignition zone is the best thing you can do, or scattering them or hauling them out and getting them chipped up um, somewhere. The other thing you can do is manage for invasive species. I showed you that Scotch picture of the Scotch broom, which I mentioned is highly flammable, but you know, they tend to be less adapted to fire and they are, um, they often outcompete our native species and then ha are a detriment to wildlife habitat. So you wanna manage for those. And then in your more forested areas within your home ignition zone, if you are, um, if you have trees that are thin and unhealthy and not able to compete with some of the larger, healthier trees and there's you know, drought issues, they're not able to get enough water, thinning some of those out can be a good idea too. Um, and you can always talk to an arborist about this stuff if you don't have the skills or the know-how to do it yourself. Um, the other thing to consider is um, the timing of your activities. I think uh, pr conifer pruning is best done in fall to early spring, real early spring, and you want to avoid doing that stuff when it's prime nesting season as well. And then if you do have forested areas, it's important to keep some canopy cover to provide more shade because then you're reducing the soil temperatures and retaining some more of that soil moisture, which makes your plants less dry and less flammable. And then you can also think about doing things like incorporating pathways through your forest, your property, where if there is a fire, it's an easy place for firefighters to access or lay hose if they need to. So um, I just want to give a quick overview of some of the resources that the Conservation District has for homeowners and communities on learning more about this stuff or getting, you know, direct assistance for what to do on your property. Um, and so we offer free wildfire risk assessments where I would come out to your property and we would walk your property together and we would, I could answer your specific questions and offer you recommendations that are very specific to your property. I also provide a follow-up um, report that you can reference after the fact. 
And then um, I need to wrap this up. So I see that and I will finish this up real quickly. Um, the other thing that we help with is a program called Firewise, which is basically a neighborhood focused program where a neighborhood can get nationally recognized for taking steps to assess their wildfire risk and then doing something about it. And there's a process for that. So we can help with that. And then of course we do a lot of education. So presentations like this one and attending outreach events and just providing resources to the public on this stuff. Um, our website is down below. We have actually some wildfire information pages on our website and that's how you get to that. It's whatcomcd.org slash wildfire and a lot of these resources I've talked about in this presentation are available on there. Um, real quickly, uh, I just want to touch on some forest resources. If you have forested property and you're looking to manage it or find out what your wildfire risk is and how to have a healthy forest, um, you can visit WSU Extension Forestry and they have tons of wonderful resources on that. DNR also offers a forest stewardship program that you can tap into. Um, and they will have a, forest, a stewardship forester that'll come out and meet you on your property and help you assess the health of your forest. So that is it for me. Um, thank you so much. I really appreciate being able to do this presentation. And that is my contact information. And um, I'm going to hand it over to Cheryl or Becky to field some questions to me if you have any. Thank you so much, Jenny. That was fantastic. Um, really informative. Uh, yes, so uh, before we start taking questions, uh, I'm going to quickly share the results of the poll. We, uh, we saw that most of our folks here today were from Bellingham. So thank you for, for doing that. That was fun. And also, I just want to um, let everyone know that if you are participating in the virtual passport, our code word for this event is FireWise. And if you don't know about the virtual passport, you can learn about it at uh, wacomwaterweeks.org. Um, if, you, if you would like to participate in it, we are doing prize drawings as part of that. And, um, and also, Becky has put a link to an evaluation in the chat box as well. We are very interested always to get your feedback on this and other events. And so if you could take a moment, click the link now and then take, you know, so that it opens in your browser for you and then take a moment to please, if you could, to complete the evaluation after this event. And, uh, and Becky has also put the evaluation and the Firewise passport code into the chat. So that is all that I have to say on those housekeeping matters. Do we have questions? And are folks uh, clear about finding the chat? That chat button is along the bottom of your screen, your Zoom controls. And you can just go ahead and type in your question. Or if you want, if you go to the participants button, open that, and you should be able to raise your hand from there. You know, Cheryl, I just realized I forgot to mention something important. Okay. Go um, ahead. So I just, I shared with you guys my, the resources that we have available through the conservation district as far as this particular program, but I probably should mention that my funding right now is gone for the moment. And so I don't, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, what I'm doing right now is putting people on a wait list for when my funding comes back through and I can start helping communities and individuals again and offering those wildfire risk assessments. So please don't hesitate to reach out. I just might have to delay you a little bit until my funding comes in. So I just want to throw that out there. Thank you for that. Thank yeah. you. Uh, let's see, we have a question from Olin. Uh, Olin writes, thanks for the good presentation, and I am curious if a list of plant flammability for local natives is something you are thinking about producing. Um, so we have, so what we have right now, probably the, the there's two resources. One is the, is this um, packet that I talked about that lists, this is uh, produced by Oregon State University. 
And it's the most comprehensive guide I've seen so far that relates to Washington and Oregon plants. Um, most of them are native that are in this booklet. This is available on our website uh, under our wildfire information pages. Um, it, not all of the plants are native, but most of them are. And then we also have um, our, when we do our plant sale, all of the plants that we offer, we will provide a fire resistant plant list out of that, um, out, of our, out of our sale list as well. So hopefully that is a good resource for you. You can also Google um, fire resistant plants of Washington and you might find some other things. Um, but I would say this packet is probably the best resource right now. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Susan who writes, how big a risk for wildfires is there around Bellingham? How, how, say, can you repeat that? Sure. How big a risk for wildfires is there around Bellingham? So that's an, a very interesting question. Um, so Bellingham itself, well, let me back up for a second. So Whatcom County, um, every five years does a natural hazard mitigation plan. And that's a plan where they look at all of the different natural hazards that could affect Whatcom County and they assess the risk of those. And so in that plan, there's a section on wildfire and there's actually a map that shows the different risk levels um, around Whatcom County. And so it really actually depends on where you are in Bellingham because there are some areas around Lake Whatcom um, that are a little bit higher risk that are still within the city. Um, there are parts of South Bellingham, like um, South of Fairhaven, like the Edgemore, Clarks Point, Chuckanut area that tend to be a little bit more high risk. So it kind of depends. Um, I've actually, I sent Cheryl a list of resources to share with you guys that I think maybe will be available as well. And one of the links on there is a is a link to that plan and the page where you can find that map if you're interested in looking at more detail on on where the different levels of risk are throughout Whatcom County. So there are pockets. Okay. And and mm -hmm. just for reference that the the risk is related to a lot of different things but mostly to population density and proximity to um, natural areas. Mostly in our area, it's forested areas versus like a grassland or something. Um, but that is kind of the basics of, you know, um, assessing wildfire risk. There's a lot more that goes into it, but that's a, that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have a, a quick question. How much does, um, does drought stress of your, of your plants impact how resistant they are to wildfire? One of the advantages of the native plants, of course, is that they'll do well without they're adapted to this period of summer drought. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm wondering if they get just as dried out or if they manage to stay a little bit moist even under the summer drought conditions. You know, that's a great question. And I think it's really dependent on the specific plant and where it's planted, honestly. Um, so the condition of the plant has a huge effect on how resistant it is to fire. If it's really drought stressed, um, it's obviously going to be a lot more dried out. It might be starting to die. It's, it's going to be more flammable because it's going to be drier. It's going to have less moisture retention in it. Um, and so there are so there are plants that are, and I'm not going to be able to come up with the specific ones off the top of my head right now, but there are plants that are considered fire resistant, but aren't necessarily drought resistant, and some that are drought resistant that are considered fire resistant, if that makes sense. So there's a lot of, there's so many different factors that go into the specific plant that it really depends on the conditions. Um, and so but I do think, you know, incorporating drought resistant plants into your yard is going to be a good thing regardless. So I don't, did I answer your question? Yes, I think so. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, let's see, we have another question from Susan. She asks, how likely will we be in a situation 
like uh, in what is going on in Portland currently, are the trees in Mount Baker area set up for clumps and groupings to slow down fires? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so different land owners, like large landowners, like Forest Service and Department of Natural Resources and Park Service manage their lands with different um, objectives in mind. And I can't speak to the wildfire resilience or condition of Forest Service lands around Mount Baker. I actually don't know the answer to that question. Um, I'm trying to remember what the rest of the question was. <laughs> Can you repeat it? Uh, yes, are the trees in the Mount Baker area set up in clumps and groupings to slow down fires? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I actually do not know the answer to that question. Yeah, I think, I think the forest is, um, is pretty much just forest. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, I, I know that there's a lot of talk about um, forest management and um, that being a key factor in whether we have these massive wildfires, and, and it is. But forest management in places like Eastern Washington and California are gonna, ha are gonna look very different than what's actually appropriate for Western Washington, where we do have, we have a lot of fuel and it's very dense, but we also have more moisture and um, things grow back really fast. So doing things like massive thinning projects and things like that aren't maybe necessarily completely appropriate to some of our wetter forests. And so um, we're, there's a lot of research going on about that right now. Um, but I do think there's, there's a lot more research going into how to manage west side forests for fire knowing that we have this increasing wildfire risk. And I don't think right now there are any clear answers, but I know it's a big focus, especially for Department of Natural Resources right now and probably for Forest Service as well. Great. Um, and I will add one more thing. I know it's, we're getting close to time. Um, that might be helpful information. The fires that we are seeing right now or that we have seen over the last couple of weeks a huge factor that played into that were these east wind events and they're not very common this time of year but if you look back in history at we've the west side of washington has had some very massive massive wildfires and every single one of those that caused massive destruction was was uh, started by these east wind events and so um I know that there's a lot of research on how, you know, different weather patterns affect, um, how climate change is affecting certain weather patterns that affect wildfire. And one of the things they're studying very closely right now is that east wind event and whether climate change will result in more of those east wind, wind events or less. And I actually just listened to a Cliff Mass weather blog recently where he said they're finding that climate change will actually Climate change impacts will actually have less of those east wind events they're predicting than more. So this was a bit of an anomaly, but it is an event that does occur and it that is kind of the one factor that can cause massive wildfires over on the west side. Yeah. Great. Uh, one last question, because uh, we are almost at time, uh, yeah. from Olin. He writes, uh, my little neighborhood used to be a firewise community, but apparently funding was cut back for grants. So we dropped out of the program. Are there other incentives to maintain a membership in firewise? Well, that is a really great question. Um, yes. So I would say, I, I know that funding can, funding is that horrible word that can be an issue in so many different areas. Um, but I do think the FireWise program is great because it does provide that framework for, for communities to follow, especially if they're starting out, right? Um, if you're trying to continue, um, you know, there are, there are resources available and be, being a FireWise community does open up opportunities for grants that if you weren't a FireWise community, you wouldn't have access to. For example, State Farm does, um, a grant every year 
And if you're a Firewise community, you can apply for this grant to do, I think it's like $500 or $1,000 or something to help with like a chipping project or whatever your community has planned. Um, and they give a lot of those out every year. So it does open the door for some of that. Um, the other thing is I feel like um, it also brings neighbors together, which right now isn't really a thing that's working so well. Um, but it brings neighbors together and also opens the door for um, professionals and experts to be part of the conversation. So typically if you have a Firewise community, there's somebody you know, like me and the Department of Natural Resources is part of the process. Um, maybe your local fire department has come out because you're a Firewise community and they're helping you be better prepared and they know your community better. So if there's a fire, you know, they've been out there, they know where things are, maybe they've, you guys have planned an evacuation route or um, you've mapped where your water resources are. So if they come in and they need to access water, they already know where it is. So it can really help with some of that response type stuff. Um, and also communication among neighbors. You know, I think it provides some tools where you can set up a communication plan where if a, a disaster happens, whether it's wildfire, earthquake or whatever, you know your neighbors that might need extra help or you know things like that so they might not be you know real solid like on the ground money type benefits but i do think there are other benefits to being part of the firewise program great great and all in response thanks so much for the feed, feedback and input susan writes nice presentation thank you and happy water week yay happy so, water <laughs> Thank you so much, Jenny. That was fabulous. Really appreciate hearing your insights and um, advice around, around this important topic. Thank you for the opportunity. All right. Well, we will go ahead and end the meeting and, uh, and I'll look forward to, um, to hopefully uh, hearing from you again in the future. Thanks so much, Jenny. Yeah, thank you everyone. Take care.